Hi, I'm Dwayne Brown. A Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, San Diego police face a lawsuit over technology for tracking cell phones. A crowded hearing was supposed to determine the fate of San Diego's first per permitted medical marijuana collective. We'll tell you why it went on the back burner. And the next time you fly out of Lindbergh Field, pay attention to Terminal 1, why airport officials want your input before rebuilding. But first, thousands of San Diegans are of Cuban descent. I'm Peggy Pico with mixed reaction to the U.S. plan to reopen relations with Cuba after 54 years. And in honor of the new Hobbit movie, putting together a feast fit for a Hobbit. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Hi, good evening. Thanks for joining us. An open government group is suing San Diego Police Department for information about high-tech surveillance technology known as stingrays. They can collect cell phone data. Privacy advocates and some lawmakers are criticizing them. Joining us with more on the story is Brad Racino from our media partner, iNewsource. Brad, tell us more about this technology and how it works. Well, these Stingray devices are about the size of a shoebox. They can be mounted to police vehicles or even planes. What they do is send out a signal to all the cell phones in an area, and they force them to connect with the device. It's basically imitating a cell phone tower. And once connected, police can gather a ton of information from the phones, including location, outgoing calls, messages, and serial numbers. Is that what SDPD is doing? Well, that's the thing. No one knows. Back in October, the First Amendment Coalition asked the department for some basic information about how this technology is used. They wanted to know who's using it, why they're using it, what guidelines are in place to prevent abuse, and also whether the department is asking a judge to authorize the use. But the department has refused to release anything except an invoice, and that's why they're being sued. And other police agencies have actually released this information, is that right? Right. The First Amendment Coalition asked for the same information from the Los Angeles Police Department a while back and got a ton of documents showing pretty much everything they asked for. Other agencies have even been proactive by putting these documents online for the public to see. But San Diego isn't doing that. Do we have any idea why? According to the city attorney's office, the Department of Justice has ordered the city not to talk about this technology which is unusual in that a federal agency is shutting down state public record laws. We've got more on that story at inewsource.org. Inewsource reporter Brad Racino. San Diego Planning Commission postponed a hearing about the zoning regulation for a marijuana dispensary. Now both sides of the debate are upset. KPBS reporter Matt Bowler joins us from the newsroom with the story. Matt, why was the, uh, remind us why the Planning Commission is looking at zoning for a marijuana collective in the first place. Well, last October, David Blair was awarded one of the first permits for a marijuana collective in San Diego. He wants to put it in a strip mall in Otay Mesa, right near the border crossing, uh, right near the border crossing. An appeal was filed by Barbara Gordon, an anti-medical marijuana activist. She says the shop doesn't meet the zoning restrictions. Today, the commission was supposed to hear arguments from both sides, but three of the commissioners had to leave at 11 a.m. They still would have been a quorum technically. They only need four commissioners to hold a vote, but both sides want all of the commissioners to go on the record. And if the collective lost at this point, that would have been it. The collective would be closed. So the uh, meeting was postponed. Uh, what kind of reaction uh, did they get uh, from folks? Well, both sides are upset the commissioners couldn't make time. Well, I'm sorry that it's not going to be heard today. There are so many people that have taken their time to come down here. We have got all these people from South Bay that are opposed to the project. I think it's unfortunate um, that we were not given the opportunity earlier given the fact that we have been in this application process for nearly a year. So what happens next, Matt? Well, the Planning Commission rescheduled the hearing for January 29th, and, and at this time there aren't any other items on the schedule for that day, but, you know, a lot can happen in a month. So for now, the collective is still closed, even though the collective board has been paying rent on the storefront since last March. KPBS reporter Matt Bowler. 
The city council recount is over in Chula Vista. Candidate Steve Padilla called it off this morning, saying many ballots weren't being taken into account. The registrar, Michael Vu, says some of the uncounted ballots arrived too late and others had signature problems. If no one else asks for a recount, the results will be final tomorrow with Padilla losing to John McCann by two votes. Now, Padilla told 10 News, quote, registered uh, Chula Vista voters had their votes thrown out. The registrar's decision to throw out these valid votes and silence these voters' voices is wrong, end quote. He says he'll now look at options to ensure voters' voices are heard. State Senator Ben Hueso is getting three years probation after a DUI arrest in Sacramento earlier this year. The South Bay Senator pleaded no contest to a lesser charge called wet reckless. He'll pay a fine and take an alcohol education class. Homeland Security says the move to restore relations with Cuba won't change immigration rules just yet. Current policy lets Cubans stay in the country if they arrive illegally. Reestablishing diplomatic ties could also mean money for the U.S. travel industry by allowing travel to Cuba. And California's agriculture industry also stands to benefit with a new market for our state's crops. The move to reopen relations with Cuba is getting mixed reaction here in San Diego. Peggy Pico finds out why. There are more than 6,000 people of Cuban descent living in San Diego County. My guest, Daniel Mera, owner of the local Cuban restaurant Andres, and SDSU professor Emerita Oliva Espin, who was born and raised in Cuba, joined me with a look at what reopening relations with Cuba after 54 years means to them. And Oliva, you lived in Cuba until you were 22 years old. Yes. You left right around the Bay of Pigs in 1961. Yes. Why did you leave? because I was beginning to teach at that time. And that summer after the Bay of Pigs invasion, um, Fidel Castro declared that the revolution was Marxist-Leninist, and all teachers had to revamp their education to teach next academic year. And I decided I could not be um, poisoning young minds with things I did not believe in, so that's why I decided to leave. Have you been back since then? Yes, I've been back three times, twice, twice in the 80s, and then in 2011, because it was 50 years since I left, and I needed to be back there. I needed it for myself. And I want to talk about that a little bit more, but first I want to talk to you, Daniel. Your father was born in Cuba. Have you ever been back? No. No, and more than anything, it was out of respect for him. The, he had uh, strong resentment to the, the regime that's there now. What is your reaction, uh, either continuing your father's uh, reaction to the regime on this uh, U.S. idea of reopening relations with Cuba? I felt that we had all the bargaining chips on our side. We've used the embargo as some kind of a leverage for many, many years. Uh, one part that is never talked about, that the leverage kept their military might at a very small uh, reduced. The, 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 the Cuban government, if they start getting influx of money, they're not going to use it for the people. They're going to use it for their government, and they're going to use it for their military. And that's, that's where I felt that we didn't go far enough to go to democracy in this type of, uh, of uh, talks. And, and I was disappointed. And Oliva, do you agree with Daniel, or do you think this is a good thing? Um, uh, yes and no. I mean, I, I agree with what he's saying. On the other hand, it's about time. Because precisely because they, the government, um, has all their needs met and, and live very well, it is the Cuban people who are suffering on the disembargo and more important, the embargo, the non-relations with the U.S. have always given them a great excuse. Any error they make is because the fault of the Americans and the fault of the embargo. And now they won't have a scapegoat to justify all the things they're doing that have created the shambles in the economy. You went back. How, how, how do you think that the embargo has uh, made the Cuban people suffer? Well, they don't have lots of medicine, they don't have lots of everyday things, and because also the government has created two different currencies, one 
of the one that all Cubans earn in pesos and the other that it's an equivalent of dollars, what is happening is that people who are doctors and engineers and nurses are driving taxis or carrying suitcases because that's the way in which they can get dollars to get to this currency. And prostitution is rampant so that it, it, for both men and women. Okay. Uh, Oliva, I mean, I, I want to ask you this, Daniel. Let me ask you this first. Uh, do you think having a, an embassy, which is part of this plan, in Havana and opening up travel between the two countries will improve the situation for the Cuban people? I would like to see the Cuban people open up their communications first before any embassy goes in. I do think an embassy has its purpose. There's still people who travel, like me. I'm a, a, a Cuban-American. If I travel to Cuba, I would like to see an embassy there because you never know what kind of trouble might occur, and it would be nice to have Uncle Sam there to help you in any case. Right now, that is not the issue. Do you, uh, are, are you hearing from other uh, Cuban Americans here in San Diego? Are they in support of this or, or not so much, or is it mixed? I, I, I've seen that the people who've lived here a little bit longer are outspoken. The people who are here very recently are not talking that much, they're mm -hmm. still afraid. That, that In Cuba you live afraid to talk. So even after you leave, even after my family came to see me last year, they spoke in very slow tone, low tones, and I said, you're in America now, you can talk. <laughs> so those are the freedoms that I would love to see come back to Cuba. And, and Aliva, you have mentioned you were even at this stage a little reluctant to talk about this. Do you feel that uh, as far as the Cuban Americans here are still reluctant? Well, I mean, it goes both ways. There are people who are, <clears throat> sorry, delighted with the idea that this is open because they will be able to see their relatives more frequently without so many complications, without spending so much money that they need to spend to bring their, I mean, Cuba is 45 minutes away from Miami and it costs thousands of dollars to get to Cuba at this point because of all the permits and all the things and et cetera. So there's that. There's also the people who are very reluctant to accept any change. And I have to say, that I understand what people who have suffered, who have parents or relatives killed or in prison for political reasons or et cetera, can't just say, oh, okay, let's go be friends. I mean, the, for them, that's not um, acceptable. Sure, so I sure. certainly can understand their position. But I know that whenever I have said that, oh, maybe there's a possibility, the reaction immediately is you must be an agent of the of so there's, Castro. there's still yeah. some of that Cold yeah, War fear. Yeah, there's still of a Cold War reaction, yes. Yes, all right. Well, we're going to have to leave it here. Uh, thank you both so much for talking about this with us. Thank you for having us. Thank you. The White House isn't quite ready to blame North Korea for a cyber attack on Sony Pictures. The company canceled the release of the movie The Interview because of threats made by a hacker group. It could be the most damaging cyber attack ever on a U.S. business. The Pentagon says more than 1,000 U.S. troops will go to Iraq soon to train the Iraqi military, but there's no word yet on who will go. They'll be assigned to train the Iraqi military. Defense officials say the job will take at least three years. A longtime member of the KPBS family has died. Paul Steen was our general manager from 1974 until his retirement in 1992. But his history with KPBS started when this television station first signed on in 1967. He was our longest serving general manager, leading the station into a new broadcast facility and giving the okay to change the KPBS radio format to all news. It was a wonderful time to be here. I think any time that you can be in on the beginning of something and then watch it as it develops and grows, um, it's the best time to be there in many ways. Traffic on California highways is breaking records. Drivers traveled about 185 billion, with a B, miles on state highways this year. Five billion more than last year. Experts say more traffic is a sign of a stronger economy. San Diego Airport wants your opinion before remodeling begins on Terminal 1. 
Peggy Pico explains how you can weigh in. Construction on Terminal 1 is expected to begin in a few years. Here with details of the remodel, why it's needed, and who's paying for it is my guest, Director of Airport Planning, Keith Wilsheets. And Keith, for those who haven't been there lately, why does Terminal 1 need to be rebuilt? Terminal 1 was actually opened in 1967, and so it's, what, 47 years old? Um, and it, uh, it's showing its age. And so uh, not only is it um, a little small for what we try and do, for example, in the um, security checkpoints, um, but it, it really wasn't built for the TSA's needs. It wasn't built for the larger aircraft that we have on, uh, on, on the runway, or near the runway. And so it's really important that we take care of that terminal as quickly as we can. And this is a part of a larger plan to develop the airport in anticipation of a lot more passengers. It is. And we anticipate that our passengers are going to increase at about 1.2% uh, to 1.8% per year for the next 20 years. And, um, and so when you think about it, in 20 years, that will be about half as many uh, passengers in addition to what we have today. And so that's a lot of passengers that are going to be going through that airport. So about 28 million per year then. About, yes, that's about the sort of the guideline. Per year. I know there's about four concepts right mm -hmm. now that are being uh, looked at as, as far as for ideas for this remodeling. How similar are they and how different are they? Uh, there's one significant difference um, and in that uh, Terminal 2 East is uh, dealt with in three of the four concepts. Terminal 2 East is the American Airlines concourse and our international concourse. And so three of the concepts would incorporate that into the future construction as well. One alternative, Alternative 1, actually maintains that. And so our board's going to need to decide do they want to take that as part of this plan or do they want to let a, a future board decide that. Yeah, and certainly uh, you can see some of the development plans on our website, kpbs.org. So we have those uh, listed there for folks to see. Now, Keith, do any of these plans that we're looking at right now, do they actually include a second runway? No. No, we have one runway, and that's all we're ever going to have at, at this site. Uh, we just don't have enough room to build a second runway at, at, at San Diego International. What about uh, trolley, linking mm -hmm. trolley or public transportation mm -hmm. to get you directly to the airport? Is that included? It, it is, and it, that's important to us. And while we aren't the trolley providers or the transit providers uh, in San Diego, uh, it's important that we partner with those that are. So Sandag and uh, the MTS, we partner with them to try and, and make um, transit to the airport as efficient as it can be. One thing we're doing with the trolley is um, every concept has a um, a, a small terminal on the north side of our runway that would connect to a future intermodal transit center that Sandag is planning to build. So when they build that transit center, we're going to build our passenger processing center, connect it with a pedestrian bridge over Pacific Highway, and then the airport will take those people from that location on airport back and forth around the runway to the terminals. It'll be a much better system that we have today. A, a lot of places have the monorails and things like that in their yes. airport to, to do similar things. Now, how much is this uh, projected cost of this rebuild here and who's going to pay for it? Well, it's a good question, and we have um, some very preliminary cost estimates right now, and all four concepts are roughly $3 billion. I think they range from $2.8 billion to $3.2 billion, um, and that will be uh, paid for over many years. It, it'll be a very long phasing plan. Um, in terms of, of who pays or how it's paid for, um, the airport doesn't take any tax dollars. We never have and we, we don't plan on starting. So um, it, it'll be paid for with passenger facility charges. So when you fly out of our airport, in fact, most airports in the United States have this. There's a $4.50 fee that's tacked onto your ticket. Um, that money goes to us to build capital projects. And so that will be one source. Uh, airline um, landing fees, um, concession fees, parking, all of those kinds of things will be used to pay so for it. So fees throughout, either Absolutely. to the airlines or to the, the passengers themselves. Correct. Uh, how can the public weigh in on what's happening here? We would encourage people to go to our website, www.sand.org slash ADP. That's where they can learn more about the concepts. There's a brief video on there that they can learn more, uh, more details about our concepts. And there's actually a survey that's right there that we'd encourage them to fill out. There's four questions that they can answer, but if they have other things to say about uh, our plans or the existing airport and how it works, please let us know. Um, that's one way. You can also come to our board meeting in January, January 15th. We're going to be uh, presenting all of this to our board. Now, the, the airport here clearly has location logistic mm -hmm. limitations on it because of its situation. 
situation. What are the plans for the future when we reach capacity? Well, that's a that's a good question. And you know, we're a downtown airport, and that is some uh, some terrific things come with having a downtown airport. It's so convenient to use, and people love it. Um, uh, but we know that in probably 20, 25 years, our runway will reach its capacity. What will happen at that time, I think San Diego is going to have to make some decisions, but that's not something we're worried about right now. All right. Keith Wilsheets, thanks so much for the update. You're very welcome. Thank you. San Diego-based Bumblebee has been acquired by a frozen foods company in Thailand. The sale price is $1.5 billion. Bucks. The uh, buyer is Thai Union Frozen Foods, owner of Chicken of the Sea, among other brands. Federal regulators, of course, still have to approve the deal. Nearly two weeks after splashing down off the coast near San Diego, NASA's Orion spacecraft is back at the Kennedy Space Center. It arrived today by truck. Engineers will now look over every inch of the capsule, learning everything they can before the next test flight in 2018. A leading science journal says San Diego scientists made one of the year's biggest breakthroughs. Joining us to explain, KPBS science reporter David Wagner. David, what local discoveries made the cut? So this is coming from the journal Science and their annual roundup of the year's biggest breakthroughs. Scientists from Scripps Research Institute in La Jolla were recognized for expanding the genetic alphabet. So for this paper, they were working with bacteria DNA, and they actually created two totally new synthetic DNA base pairs called X and Y on top of nature's four letters A, C, G, and T. They were the first team to get synthetic DNA replicating inside a living organism. That sounds pretty impressive considering the competition they faced. Yeah, this journal's readers thought so too. So the editors picked the European Space Agency's comet landing as the year's biggest achievement. But in an online poll, the readers chose synthetic DNA over some stiff competition. They were up against projects like curing hepatitis C and showing that blood transfusions from young mice can rejuvenate old mice. Uh, when I interviewed the researchers behind it, they were really happy to get such an enthusiastic response from the public. And they said uh, securing funding for further research will probably be a lot easier now. KPBS science reporter David Wagner. The new Hobbit movie opened last night in theaters, and our arts reporter Beth Accomando has an annual tradition for these movies where she actually cooks up Hobbit meals. If you would like to put on some Hobbit meals to celebrate the new Hobbit movie, it takes a lot of food, as you can see. This is, like you have first breakfast and second breakfast, this was second shopping. First shopping was the meat. Um, as you know, meat's back on the menu, boys. Very important, uh, you need your bacon, you need your beef, you need your pork, you need your lamb. The best way to go about prepping for Hobbit meals at the shopping level, I found, is you put all your recipes together. After picking the recipes, I created a three-page shopping list for Hobbits. They're little, but they eat a lot. Hobbits you have to think of as like birds, like hummingbirds. They burn a lot of energy, so they eat a lot. And when you put on a Hobbit meal, you're basically eating every two hours if you want to fit all seven Hobbit meals plus dessert. Bacon is key to all Hobbit cooking. Butter. Lots of butter. Lots of cream. This is Middle Earth Recipes. It's a website. It's put together by Lord of the Rings and Hobbit fans. And I highly recommend this as the place to go for the starting point for any Hobbit meal marathon. Not only are the recipes authentic in terms of something that might be appropriate to find at one of the establishments in the Lord of the Rings world, but it also has a great sense of humor. So this is the recipe for 10 cup ranger cookies, which is one of my favorites, not just because it tastes good, but because the recipe itself is fun. It says in the description, this is for rangers in the field who only have one measuring cup with them. This is one of the easiest cookie recipes you will ever have because it's literally 10 cups with two eggs added and you throw everything into a bowl and that's it. A cup of butter and then a cup of peanut butter. This hobbit doesn't have a lot of sous chefs helping out so we don't have everything already pre-measured. <laughs> and then we add two types of sugar, regular white sugar and brown sugar. All right, and then we add the eggs and we will blend that. 
and your one cup of self-rising self -rising flour. And now you can add some of the fun stuff. So there's coconut and one cup of oatmeal. And you have your choice. You can either add rolled oats or quick oats. Quick oats will be softer, rolled oats will be crunchier. I go for crunchier. And chocolate chips. And a coarsely chopped nut of your choice. Walnuts and pecans seem to be the best. Okay, the recipe calls for your 10th cup to be raisins. I am not a big raisin fan. So what I usually do is add an extra half cup of nuts and an extra half cup of chocolate chips. All right, so that is your 10 cup Ranger cookie dough, which you will drop by about a tablespoon size full onto a lined cookie sheet and cook for 13 minutes at 350 degrees and you will have 10 cup Ranger cookies to serve for dessert. Mmm, yummy. You can see more of Beth's Hobbit cooking and get the recipes on her blog, kpbs.org slash cinema junkie. We've got a warming trend ahead, mostly 60s along the coast and sunny through Sunday. Uh, about the same in the Inland Valley, slightly warmer Sunday, 70s there. A chance for showers, though, in the mountains Saturday. Clouds and sun in the desert warming into the 70s by Sunday. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.